Austin, thank you for leading that last song. I had not planned that. It just shows that Austin is a mature Christian who thinks about things in the right way. But I'll ask you something. Why don't we sing that song more often? I think a lot of times we want to sing that song right as someone is baptized, but we really need the reminder, dead to the world, to voices that call me, living anew, obedient but free, dead to the joys that once did enthrall me, yet tis not I, Christ liveth in me. Can we say that? Is that true of us? Did we give up joys that once did enthrall us? And Stephen, thank you for the reading and the careful way you did it this morning. I have a question for you. Why does Paul implore us to be reconciled to God? Well, I think he tells us in this passage. He says, first of all, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Are we ready? Do we understand that there is a, a, an appointment coming that I'm going to be there, and so are you. And no one has any choice about being in that appointment, at that appointment. In fact, he doesn't make it some will. He says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But Paul seems to, to, to really crank up the pressure on us when he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What is there to be afraid of in appearing before the judgment seat of Christ? We live in a day and time when everyone wants to say God is love and God loves everyone. And that is true, that he does love everyone, but he's not our buddy. He's not our grand, indulgent grandfather. He has a standard for us and he expects us to meet his standard, and he's going to take everything we say and do and measure it against his standard. And those who don't meet it will spend an eternity in hell. I know when a preacher says that nowadays, well, that's not very politic, it's not very smooth, but that is why Paul says Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade others because Paul did not want us to go to that appointment unprepared. And I can tell you that anyone who proclaims the gospel or teaches scripture, they want you to be prepared for that day. I want to be prepared for that day. So, why then, if God loves everyone, must we be reconciled to God? We want to look at that this morning. I think there's some very basic things that we need to be reminded of, or maybe you've never heard it before, but we need to think about it. This used to be called the fall of man. I understand that in a politically correct society, that it's a misogynistic to say the fall of man. But it used to be that you could say the word man and understood that in some context that included both men and women. But to accommodate modern language, we'll say the fall of humanity. 
We have to go back to the beginning to understand this. In Genesis 1, 26 through 27, it is recorded that God created man and woman. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Why was man given dominion? God created man in his own image. And the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created man and woman in his image. That meant... Maybe in a way we don't think about it, that we became the idols of God. We actually represent God in the world. That we were made to reflect his image, his character, his what he does. In fact, God rules over heaven and earth, he rules over everything, and God made us in his image, to have dominion over the creation. But what does that mean then? Have you ever heard people arguing about, well, Adam and Eve must have been naive. Adam and Eve were like children. Maybe. I doubt it. Because Adam was was an adult with intellect and reason. Adam named the animals. That meant that Adam had to be smart enough to know what they were and to call them by proper names. And you can see God is giving him right from the beginning dominion over creation. You name it. I made it, but you name it. And... Adam was given powers of observation. Adam understood the meaning of the pairing of males and females in the animal kingdom. He knew what it was for. And when he looked over that, he gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field, But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. It wasn't that God found that out. Who figured that out? Adam. So we know Adam had intellectual capability. And we know that Adam understood that when Eve was created by God, that he understood he had a special gift and a great and precious relationship to the female, to the woman. The man said, this at last. Do you think of that? The last thing to be created was the woman to be someone complementary to the man. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam did not have a blank sheet. He did not sit there and couldn't figure out what had happened. He knew that God created the woman from him. And he said, given what I have observed and what I know, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. But I want you to see that, God, that Adam had the intellectual capability to understand what God had done for him. And he understood what God made Eve for. And he understood that a man and a woman were to be paired for life. Does that sound like somebody who didn't know what was going on? On top of that, Adam and Eve enjoyed a personal relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3 and verse 8, we're told, And they heard the sound of the Lord God 
walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Wouldn't it be nice if God could be, live among us? Or we, maybe I need to reverse that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could live in a personal, material relationship with God every day? And so he had that personal relationship. He had intellect and understanding, and he had the ability, whoops, he had the ability to actually understand what God communicated to him. In Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Adam wasn't in a chaise lounge while he was in the garden. God, work was not something that was put on man as the result of sin. Man was created to work. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So Adam understood this. Well, how do I know that Adam understood it? Because he communicated that to his wife Eve. In fact, it kind of appears that maybe Adam was concerned enough about God's command that he, he made it real clear to Eve, we really don't want to do this. In Genesis 3, verses 2 through 3, we, we read that Eve said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. It appears that maybe Adam added, neither shall you touch it. Why? Because in the day that you eat of it, you will die. In that, though, it tells me something that Adam and Eve understood what death was. <clears throat> They knew it was bad enough that they did not want to do it, maybe even touch it, because in the day you touch it, what will happen? You'll die. I believe, though, from they understood death in a material sense. So there's a lot of questions like, well, how? How did they know that? But they sure understood it. But I think that they had a slight misunderstanding because it appears from the narrative that they thought death would be immediate and instantaneous. And Satan used that against them to say, you will not die. Well, Satan told a half-truth. They would not die that day. Aren't there a lot of people in this world today who will tell you, oh, I thought if I ever did that, I would die. God would strike me dead, but nothing happened. Oh, yeah, something has happened, but we don't think of it because it's not immediate and it's not material. But notice what happened. When they sinned. At the end of Genesis chapter 3, we are told, Therefore the Lord God sent him out, sent Adam from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In the garden, Adam enjoyed a personal relationship with God. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven from the garden and they were separated from God. And ever since, humanity has been separated from God. 
Why? Because sin drives a wedge between man and God. In Isaiah 59, Isaiah wrote to the children of Israel, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Do we understand that? That sin drives us away from God. That we know, I mean, that's frightening when you think about it. He's made a separation between you and your God, and your sins has hidden his face from you and so that he does not hear. It's not just bad enough that I can't be in his presence. Now he doesn't even listen to my pleas. This is something I don't think we think about. Look at Psalm 73, 26 through 27. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now notice what the psalmist says next. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. What happened in the garden? When Adam and Eve were separated from the presence of God, they lost the sustainer of life. Yeah, the physical body doesn't die right away, but death begins. And you don't want to be far away from God because Paul even pointed out to the Athenians that God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since what? Since God himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Do we think about that? That without God, no life would exist? Without God, you cannot sustain life. And I want to propose to you that what happened in the Garden of Eden was that man was separated from God and his material death began because he was separated from the source of life. But here's something we need to think about, and Jesus certainly taught it in Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Wait a minute. Did you catch that? There are two deaths. There's the death of the body and the death of the soul. And so Jesus taught, rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I've wondered, was there something about the order in what Jesus said there? Did you notice he began by saying, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul. He switched the order and body and hell. By the way, Byron didn't say that. Jesus said that. He used the word hell. Here's something we don't think about. The death of the soul happen, can happen before the death of the body. Do we think about that? In 1 Timothy 5, verses 5 and 6, Paul is talking about a widow who should be supported and widows who should not be supported, and he says, 
She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. That's someone who should be supported. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Wow. It's possible that your soul could be dead before your body ever gets there. I want to propose to you that's what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. They did die. The death that matters the most. And the truth of the matter is, and Paul teaches this, it doesn't matter whether you were Jew or Gentile, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have dead souls, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins and once you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. When I visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, I understood what this meant, this idea of following the course of this world. There were so many people in that place that when you went up to see where the Calvary was, Calvary was, Calvary was that what happened was they were fitting so many people through such a narrow space that once you went into it, you no longer were going under your own power. You were being carried along. And the picture is being said here, there are, the whole world is dead and trespasses and sins, and I'm being carried along. I'm being carried along, and I have used to live among those people, or maybe you are now, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Remember, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, because everyone is dead in trespasses and sins, and by nature are children of wrath. Why did Adam and Eve not die physically immediately? Ezekiel 18, verse 32. God says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. Have we ever thought the fact that people do not die immediately for their sins is the sign of a merciful and patient God. In Romans 2 and verse 4, Paul getting after the Jews because they had not been following God's word, as they should, says, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing this? that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Do we think about that? The reason, the reason we're not struck dead when we sin is because God is kind, He's forbearing, and He's patient, and He's putting this off as long as He can, not so you can enjoy life, but so that you can repent. Because in the Old Testament, God says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. 
Cast away from you all the transgressions you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? His forbearance, patience, and kindness was giving the nation a chance to repent. We like to talk a lot about echoes or shadows in the Old Testament. Let me tell you, the history of Israel and 450 years of sin before God sent them into exile teaches us that God, of God's forbearance, patience, and kindness giving them time to repent. And that translates over to all of mankind. Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. Some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Why? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Do we understand that without God, that sin separating us from God has separated us from the sustainer of life and that we're in danger of eternal damnation because we have not repented? And so... The need for all of mankind, for all of humanity, if you will, is to restore that relationship. Because without it, we're dead. So how can I turn and live? Sin has separated us from God. And without God, everything dies. Do I need to say that? We say it's the cycle of life that everything dies. It doesn't have to be that way. But separation from God has caused it to be that way. And what we should learn from it is that God is the giver and sustainer of life. But you know, here's the problem. When you're dead, you cannot help yourself. You can go to the dead and you can touch them, but they don't respond. They can't bury themselves. But think about what God does. We walked away from Him. For while we were still weak, can you be any weaker than dead? For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the lovable. Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I want you to think about this next. This is one of those run-over statements that we ought not to run over. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. You ever met someone who's righteous, but you're not too fond of them? But somebody who's righteous and good does a lot for everybody. Someone might die for them. He wants you to think for a second. Christ died for the ungodly. Well, who would do that? But God. But, right? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for sinners. No, for us. (laughs) Us. 
Don't put yourself in some kind of class apart from that. You're not. Why did he do that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So I want you to watch this. God loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. What is the sustainer and giver of life doing? He it loves us so much that even while we were sinners, even though we were dead and weak and helpless, He provided the means to get, reanimate us, to give us life, to make us a new creation. Notice what... It says when Jesus is introduced in the Gospel of John, all things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. No wonder Jesus said to Philip, I am the way. I am the truth. Notice what it says. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's reconciliation. But, who is it for? What does Jesus mean? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ, but has passed from death to life. If while we're in sin we are dead, then once we have believed in Jesus and believed the words that he said, what happens? We have moved from death to life. And then he tells us how that happens. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Well, we ought to know that by now. The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. Do you catch that? The spirit gives life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And then he says, truly, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That makes perfect sense, right? It is the Spirit who gives life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and in life. Well then, how do I live? Truly, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word. Well, you have to, because they're spirit and life. And if you keep my word, which are spirit and life, he will never see death. Does that make sense? So what does Jesus say? John 8, 24. Believe or die. That's what he's saying. Believe or die. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, what will happen? You will die in your sins. Well, how about this? Repent or perish. 
Luke 13, 5. Now, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, you will perish. You believe that I am He, or you die. You repent, or you perish. Let me tell you, there's an or clause here too. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Who said that? Jesus. But he also said, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. So we have believe or die, repent or perish, be baptized or condemned. Who said that? Jesus. And then he says, that's not it. And that's why I reminded us that we ought to sing this song that buried with Christ more often than we do. Because he says, be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. This is why. Right here. All of what I talked about is why Paul says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you. That's not like we hope. We know what's coming. The words of Jesus have told us. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He who does not believe will be condemned. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why? Why? For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we beg you and we implore with you, believe, repent, and be baptized so that you can be saved from eternal death. If we can help you do that, please come forward as together we stand and sing.